So today, you will learn about the best molecule of all time. Dopamine. Before we get into the actual molecule, let's rewind several decades in order to learn a little history about dopamine. In 1957, British researcher Kathleen Montagu first discovered that dopamine was in the human brain. In that same year, Swedish scientist Arvid Carlsson found that dopamine was a neurotransmitter, and he actually received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2000 for his work. So clearly, he was pretty well respected for his studies. So the components of dopamine are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. This is the chemical formula as well as the structure. Note that dopamine is made up of a benzene ring, which is a molecule composed of six carbon atoms with one hydrogen atom attached to each carbon atom. So that is the hexagon in the diagram. Two hydroxyl side groups and one amine group accompany the benzene ring to complete the molecule. If you zoom out a bit, you'll realize that there are approximately 400,000 dopaminergic neurons, neurons that primarily release dopamine in the brain. They are produced in two small areas of the brain, the substantia nigra, right there, and the ventral tegmental area, or VTA, there. These neurons send out signals to many other areas of the brain and can have powerful effects on their targets. And there are actually five different dopamine receptors, so depending on where it is sent, dopamine plays an important role in various functions like movement, motivation, addiction, and reward. So back to what dopamine actually does as a neurotransmitter. Generally speaking, neurotransmitters are released in response to an action potential when a depolarizing current causes the cell membrane's resting potential of negative 70 millivolts to pass a certain point called the threshold, which is typically negative 55 millivolts. If this level is not reached, then no action potential is fired. However, if it is reached, then the cell membrane will shoot up to 30 plus millivolts. From this point, the membrane repolarizes to the point of hyperpolarization, which prevents the production of another action potential. Eventually, the membrane is brought back to its resting state. Essentially, an action potential is an electrical current. So when this action potential travels from the dendrites along the neuron to the axon terminal, the same impulse cannot continue to the next neuron due to the space called the synaptic cleft. This is where the neurotransmitters come in. They are what perpetuate the signal. The electrical impulse causes vesicles, which contain the neurotransmitters, to fuse with the axon terminal membrane. Then, they release the chemicals into the synaptic cleft through exocytosis. The neurotransmitters bind to receptors on usually dendrites, but they can also bind to axons or the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron. The binding of the neurotransmitters will either stimulate or prevent another action potential in the next neuron. From here, the receptors release the chemicals into the cleft. Some return to the presynaptic neuron through transporter proteins, while others are degraded and destroyed by enzymes. Now, I think we all know the effects that cocaine has on an individual. The drug produces a high, stimulating positive feelings initially. This occurs due to an influx of dopamine in the synaptic cleft. Recalling that after neurotransmitters bind to the receptors, they usually re return to the presynaptic neuron through transporter proteins. Well, cocaine actually blocks those receptors, producing a buildup of dopamine in the synaptic cleft. This results in an amplified signal to the subsequent neuron or neurons, and users become filled with pleasurable emotions. However, these feelings only last for about 10 minutes. After the high is over, the dopamine level decreases substantially, causing feelings of sadness and even depression. This is why many users continue taking cocaine or other drugs to attain that high so they don't feel these negative emotions. Now, it is important to note that the body quickly learns to resist the effects of cocaine, so users have to use more and more to reach a high. This typically results in drug addiction. So cocaine use showcases the pleasurable feelings associated with an increased dopamine level. 
Decreased dopamine levels, on the other hand, cause many negative effects. Parkinson's disease is a prime example of this. It is caused by the degeneration of neurons in the substantia nigra of the brain. Consequently, the lack of dopamine causes the nerves to function improperly so it is harder to control body movements. Understandably, the main symptoms of Parkinson's disease are slowness, tremors, dull facial expressions, instability, and stiffness. If taking into account the effects of both cocaine and Parkinson's disease, you realize that a dopamine balance must be maintained in order to function properly. Moving on, the most important reward pathway in the brain is the mesolimbic dopamine system. Natural rewards like delicious food or social interaction stimulate the release of dopamine, causing feelings of pleasure. As a result, an individual learns to repeat the same behavior over and over again in order to attain that reward once again. Despite the strong connection between dopamine and reward, there is controversy concerning this idea called the reward theory. A popular alternative explanation is the incentive salience theory, the belief that dopamine increases the effects of all motivators regardless if it is a positive or negative effect. Another view that challenges the reward theory is known as the reward prediction error. This asserts that dopamine is more associated with the degree to which the reward is expected. So an expected reward does not produce an activation of dopamine cells, but an unexpected reward stimulates an activation of dopamine. Now, pharmaceutically, dopamine also faces controversy. Antipsychotic drugs are used to control dopamine levels in order to treat disorders that cause psychosis, which is described as a loss of contact with reality. For example, schizophrenia falls under this category. The use of these types of drugs has long been debated over because they suppress certain behaviors. Consequently, the affected individual experiences symptoms like unclear thinking and dullness of thought. So while their poor behavior is resolved, they simultaneously cannot totally express pleasure. Dopamine also comes as a drug itself under names like entropin and revamine. It is injected and used to treat hypotension or low blood pressure, slow heart rate, circulatory shock, or cardiac arrest. So, as you can see, dopamine is a very, very complex molecule that is involved in numerous areas of the brain and body. It is an essential neurotransmitter and necessary for the proper function of many organisms. And though we know a lot about this molecule, scientists continue to research dopamine in order to further our understanding.